The technology that we have today, actually in this case, the technology that evolved in 2005 led to a palm print uh, to help this detective work with the other detectives to identify this individual. Seven cases. The serial rapist was responsible for seven cases. Three in Orlando, four in the Volusia County area. And all of those victims are with us today, in, meaning they're still here on Earth. They're still alive. And with the exception of one who is living outside of this country, they're all wanting to see justice done for this individual who committed this heinous crime against them. So the detective will talk about some of the cases that we worked here in, mainly in the east side of Orlando. Through the process, I learned that back then, one of our then uh, person who retires as a lieutenant, Debbie Driscoll, Driscoll was the one who worked the cases, was able to put together that there were some consistencies. And one crime analyst or um, crime scene investigator had the presence of mind to capture a palm print that back then could not be used but years later proved to be the key to identify this person that we've been looking for for a very long time. So with that said, I know that you will probably have additional questions that you can ask. I'll turn it over to the sheriff and then the PIOs will come up again and introduce Detective Field. Thank you, Chief. Sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in my 16 years here as the sheriff and the police chief, OPD does never disappoint me when they get their hands on a tough assignment, and this one was a tough assignment. You're looking at a serial rapist, you're looking at a predator, you're looking at a guy who stole from these women. He stole their sense of self-being when he committed these horrible, horrible acts. And like a coward and a scumbag that he is, he's disappeared. So I want to share with you from our end what we were looking at. On January 16th, 1992, a female was in her apartment when she, walked into her, when she walked into her bedroom, she was grabbed from behind, forced on the bed, and sexually assaulted as the male talked about threatening to kill her during the whole process. In July 20th, 1993, a female woke up in her bedroom around 5 a.m. and saw the suspect naked crawling out of her bedroom. She screamed, he ran away. But when she went into the living room to investigate, he jumped out from behind the wall, forced her back into the bedroom where he sexually assaulted her. And then on May 11th, 1998, 20-year-old female was walking on the beach when she was knocked to the ground and at rape point was sexually assaulted. As we knew, and there's another job in the Daytona Beach that matches similar, and in this case has been cold, has been cold for us until we got the phone call from Detective Fields, and I think you really, really have to see the great work that was done on this. And now we have to apprehend this guy. And the Sheriff's Office, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office, is offering a $25,000 reward for any information that leads to his arrest. You don't have to do anything else. Pick up the phone, let us know where he's at, so we can work with OPD and bring this scumbag to justice. We owe it to these women. And now you will hear from Lead Detective Michael Fields. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Fields, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-F-I-E-L-D-S. In December of 2018, the Orlando Police Department examined this case and, and believed that the use of forensic genetic genealogy could, could benefit this case. Because since June of 2018, the investigative genetic genealogy has rapidly emerged as a highly effective tool in using DNA to identify unknown persons, whether they are unidentified bodies or suspects in crimes. So we took the use of traditional ge genealogy, combined it with the use of te technology, and combined it together to form what is known as investigative genetic genealogy. Um, it, on June 17th of 1988, the city of Orlando responded to a call on the east side of town for a woman who was se sexually battered. This crazy woman sur survived a 20 minute ordeal of being raped at night point by the, the suspect. On July 30th of 1988, City of Orlando responded to an additional call for service for a woman who, again, was held captive and raped and, and sexually battered multiple times. And on February 16th of 1989, the Orlando Police Department responded to our third call for a sexually battered incident in the City of Orlando. Um, and, 
in 2018, I had started the, the case. I began to work on it. I used the use of our forensic ge genetic genealogy. But I also wanted to start from the beginning. We sent off the, the latent prints back to, um, to APHIS. And if you can think about 1988, there was no use of the palm prints in, in the use of crime, crime uh, solving. It wasn't until 2005 that the use of palm prints became uh, a tool for us to use. So when we re resubmitted those palm prints, it came back as a hit for Leslie Lagrada. Um, we were able to take that information and focus in on his family and use the genetic gene genealogy to eliminate everyone else in his immediate family. Uh, by the use of ser search warrants, consent, and other means to, to get the, the DNA from family members to show that the only person that could have done this heinous crime was Leslie Lagrada. Um, and then, w during the investigation, we learned in 2010 he was arrested in Volusia County for uh, resisting an officer with violence. Part of the resolution of his case was to submit his DNA into the database. Uh, when he learned that that was going to happen, this feckless coward took $22,000 out of his bank account and fled. The last thing he told one of his relatives is, the police are going to get my DNA, I need to leave town. I'm going to go to prison. So he, he fled. We were able to take his family's D DNA and use YSTR te testing to prove that it was him and to use uh, ge genetic genealogy. Any questions? So, do we have any idea where this guy might be? Is any other trails? Because you just can't ever get cash, so we couldn't find him. Um, we, the U.S. Mar Marshals have been, have been trying to lo locate this, uh, this defendant for about a year and a half now, and we do not have any leads as to where he, he is. There's a possibility he could have left the country, but there's no evidence to show that he has left the country, but we, we believe that is a possibility. When is the last time he was seen? Was that in 2010 when he was arrested? The last time, our, our, investigation, our investigation showed the last time he was seen was in 2010 when he told his, his brother, I have to leave town, I'm going to go to prison. Yes. We've been using fingerprints since, yes, we've been using fingerprints at, uh, since 1902. And, it, but it's only been the, the fingerprints. Uh, the, the use of palm prints did, didn't come across in, in the criminal world until 2005. So our, our CSIs were able, in, back, back in the 1980s, e even though they, they knew that there was no s system to gather that, that palm print, and, and to use it, they, they gathered it anyway, which was phenomenal. And now, because they had the forethought to grab that palm print from the window that he used to, to force his way inside of the, 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 the victim's apartment, um, they, that palm print came back as a match to him. So, but, not, yes. I don't think to connect the dots that correct. was in Volusia County in 2010. Well, real quick, as he's not giving credit to himself, he was working a cold case that you covered and it was the victim from our homicide that was identified through the process that you described earlier. And then he began to focus on another case, which was this one, and he began to look at the files as a cold case, and he saw the palm print, and he requested for that palm print to be processed, and that led to identifying the individual. So that was in 2018 that the palm print was actually connected to this guy? Yes. No, no, I'm sorry. The, the palm print is separate. It's F FBI APHIS, Automatic Fingerprint index, index System. So, yes, it, it went into a separate database, a fingerprint database. Okay, the reading of the palm print. Yes. And then that matched up with? Yes, it was just another tool. They're completely separate, okay. but we had thought that everything was, every I was dotted and every T was crossed. Just like any, any investigation, we wanted to make sure again that every I was dotted, every, every T was crossed, and that's when we realized the technology back in 1988 did not allow for a palm print. The technology at the time that we looked at it now said that we could use that technology. So the original warrant for this guy was last year. Was it since then that he's been active using other means? 
No, the warrant had come out. We, we were trying to locate him um, on our own, and now we are asking for the public's help. There is no doubt in my mind there are additional vi victims or survivors out there. Uh, these are the only ones that have been co connected through science. Do we know anything about this man? Does he live in Orlando? Was he from Orlando? Did he work anywhere in particular? He, a lot of women, I'm just trying to figure out what is his background. Leslie Lagrada lived in the Volusia County. He, he owned a home out in, in Volusia County. He had a girlfriend who lived on the east side of town. That is the, the nexus we believe to why he was on the east side of town. Um, but he, he lived, worked in Volusia County. Do you think that he had gone dormant between that 10 year period or do you think possibly he may have been some other area that we just don't know about? I, I don't think that, that I can, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. What about the lead that you have been receiving? Has any of them been any, anything of any, any value as far as where he could possibly be? We have had zero leads as to his whereabouts as of right now. That is why we are asking for anyone who has any information to please contact the Orlando Police Department, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office, or Crime Line. I saw that he had had a stalking charge in his past um, back in the 80s. Was there anything else in his past that would have given a hint that this guy might have been up to a little bit more? In, in hindsight, yes, it's easy to look back and, and see a pattern. Uh, when he was arrested for the resisting with violence, he was actually outside of a woman's window, um, and, the, and the, the officers arrived, saw, saw him, chased him. He wanted to get away. He fought the officers to try to get away. So yes, in hindsight, it's easy to look back and see a pattern of his cre creepy appearance. It, it, it had not been made. Um, there was at, at that point, his DNA was not in the database. One of the resolutions to his case was, we're going to let you out, you're going to have this amount of probation, and you had to submit your DNA to the database. And he knew right then and there that he was going to be in, in a large amount of trouble. And he told his family member, I'm going to go to prison, I, I need to leave town. There is absolutely a, a pattern of his, his se sexual batteries. Um, he preyed on women who were alone. He preyed at women who were home alone between hours of midnight and five o'clock in the morning. And there are some other patterns which we, uh, we choose to withhold as of right, right now until trial. But there, there are some other patterns there. With the exception of being uh, young, and white, um, that's, that's the only similarities that I'm aware of. When he contacted the survey and said, hey, we think we've got this guy, I mean, it's been decades. What was the response that you got? I know that the detectives from the sheriff's office um, con contacted their, their victims. I can't speak for, for those, but the three victims I contacted uh, were very shocked and surprised. They had they had already moved on and, and thought that this was never going to, to get solved. And um, uh, although it drummed up new, um, it drummed up old feelings, they, they were very happy to, to know that we knew the identity of the suspect and we were trying to actively search him out. So they got to be fearful too, knowing that he's still out there somewhere. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think that I would be able to, to answer that question. I, I, it, I think it's obvious to, to think that, but I, I did not ask that. And when you identified him in 2018 and the search started, it's been three years since you've been searching for him. What's prompting this press conference today? Is it that people have not come forward with his whereabouts? The U.S. Marshals has come to a dead end. They uh, are unable, unable to locate him. We were hoping to locate him um, and, and bring him to justice. So now we are at the point where we need the public's help to try to locate him. I definitely believe he has left the state of Florida.
and possibly even the United States. So I'll add a few more comments and I'll let the sheriff wrap it up. But another point to make a note of is the fact that we're highlighting the importance of how science, technology, and great detective work is leading to solving some of these cases and to what you said a few minutes ago that are decades old, right? So this is just the beginning of greater things to come when it comes to bringing justice to these victims that deserve for these individuals to be not only caught but held accountable for their actions. So the message should be clear for anyone who has engaged or has even thought about get, engaging in that type of violence that the technology is moving in the direction where it's very favorable for law enforcement to solve these crimes. So if anyone out there has any information, please share it. There's got to be someone who knows a little bit about this individual, especially after now his name and picture has been shared. And even if it's something that they, they are just wondering whether it would be useful or not, come forward, report it. And the sheriff had just mentioned a very generous reward for someone who could lead us to the apprehension of this guy. Sure. I, I, I just want to reiterate that this was done, as the chief said, with great technology, but also great police work. You know, and this isn't the first time in my career OPD has, has done something for me in Volusia County or in, uh, as, as the police chief in Daytona. You can't outrun your DNA, and that's what the chief's telling you. You can't outrun it. And, and you have men and women that are working all the time to try to bring closure to these victims because we have lots of DNA, we have lots of cases like this, but it takes great cops to do their job, coupled with technology, to come after this guy. And again, $25,000, you don't have to testify or do anything. Tell us where to find him and let these guys, these men and women, do their job. Thank you. He has seven si siblings, um, some, of, some of which were very helpful, some of which were not very, very helpful, which is why we had to execute cer search warrants to get their DNA. Um, but, but some were very helpful and felt very saddened for the, for the survivors. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. So, lo que queríamos dejar saber hoy es que esta persona ha sido identificada como la persona responsable por las violaciones de siete mujeres aquí en el condado de Orange y en la ciudad de Orlando y en el condado de Volusia County. A través del de proceso de ciencia, de tecnología, la gran labor de nuestros detectives y en, co en colaboración con otros detectives de Volusia County pudieron hacer esto posible hoy para poder hacer lo posible en el 2020 para, para identificar esta persona que fue responsable. Ahora, desde el 2010 no hemos encontrado, no, no sabemos dónde está. Se ha hecho todo lo posible para tratar de localizarlo. Es posible que ya se fue del país. No creemos que está aquí en el estado. Y necesitamos la ayuda de las personas que quizás sepan algo, que nos lo dejen saber, que por favor co compartan con nosotros aquella información la cual quizás pueda ser clave para poder localizarlo. Y el alguacil mencionó que hay una recompensa de 25 mil dólares para la persona que pueda dar esa información para poder localizarlo. ¿Qué ha pasado con las víctimas? ¿Cómo se están tratando ellas? Después de Son siete de las, oh, ellos han hablado con las víctimas, muchos de ellos están sorprendidas de que esta persona ha sido identificada. Habían perdido en parte fe que iba a ser el caso, pero obviamente está muy alegre que ya se sabe quién es. Ahora lo que esperan es que, por, que alguien quizás dé la información necesaria para poder identificarlo. ¿Hago un llamado a la comunidad en particular? Este, este, ¿Esta persona puede ser muy peligrosa? Obviamente. Es, es un crimen como este es imperdonable, en, en, en mi opinión. Una persona que es una víctima de algo, una violación como esta, es algo lo cual nunca debe suceder y las personas que son responsables deben obviamente pasar por un proceso donde justicia tiene que ser lo correcto. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you again everyone for being here. This concludes our conference. The media relations team will be available for any additional requests, emails, or this image um, that you needed for your uh, broadcasting.